Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Jen Kretzer. I'm the Programs Director for the Wild Center in upstate New York, and I'm here today in our nation's capital on Earth Day, uh, broadcasting live from the U.S. Department of Energy um, for our webinar on a guide to convening youth on climate change, how to plan your own youth climate summit. First, I'd like to just acknowledge our partners today, um, Aztec, the, the Association of Science Technology Centers, as well as the U.S. Department of Energy, and of course, the Wild Center um, up in the Adirondacks. Today's presenters include, um, include myself and uh, Tammy Morgan, who's the AP Environmental Science teacher from the Lake Placid High School and one of the co-founders of the Adirondack Youth Climate Summit and on our steering committee. Uh, Aaron Weaver, a freshman at Georgetown University and Meadow Hackett, a senior at Villanova School of Business. Uh, both of these young women have been a part of the Youth Climate Summit, both as a participant and as part of our student steering committee. And they're going to share with you um, their own perspectives on how this summit uh, impact, impacted their lives as well as could potentially impact the lives of students in your community. So first off, I'd like to tell you a little bit about why I'm here um, as the Director of Programs for the Wild Center and what kind of got me involved with uh, climate change and working with youth. Uh, back in 2008, the Wild Center hosted a large climate conference and um, all of the usual suspects were in the room, organ organizations, businesses, renowned scientists, and at the last minute there were a few extra spots open and I invited um, I knew of a science teacher in Lake Placid, Tammy Morgan, and had some high school students that were interested in coming, and I invited them. And um, after the conference, um, probably around one in the morning, actually, on day two, uh, one of the students, Zach Berger, sent me an email saying that how much he enjoyed the conference, but also he did notice there was a considerable lack of young people there. And he really felt that it was time to bring young people to the table and to um, address climate change from a youth perspective. And I immediately knew at that point that this was, um, this was the moment, this was my call to action. Um, and from that moment on, uh, working with Zach and then other youth, um, the Adirondack Youth Climate Summits have been uh, a really huge, important part of my life. As part of the program today, we hope to convene a conversation around climate change that is solution-oriented and student-driven, identify resources to help you increase climate and energy literacy, and we will give you strategies to engage, involve, and inspire youth, as well as tools to support you plan a summit from start to finish. Really, um, as we go through the, the program today, um, we are going to provide you an overview of our own uh, Wild Center's Adirondack Youth Climate Summit um, and share with you the outcomes and impacts that we've had over the last six years. We want to talk a little bit about summits in other places. There's, we've already been able to um, model this summit in, in the U.S. and overseas. We've recently created a toolkit, um, an interactive online toolkit, which we'll also walk through to help share um, all the different things, the materials and, and resources that, that you have. And at the end, we're going to have some time for questions and answers. So as an overview for the Adirondack Youth Climate Summit, um, I'd first actually like to play a short um, video. If we don't do something within the next 10 years, it's going to be just too late. If you really get people fired up about something, then they'll do it. The bigger group is going to have more power to have the ideas push forward. And it's obviously, we are, we live in a finite planet, so it means that I need to protect what what I happen to love. The Youth Climate Summit at the Wild Center is two days of workshops and lectures where uh, we have 28 teams here from schools across the North Country, colleges and high schools, just talking about creative solutions to climate change and how we can get our message out and make changes in our schools. 
and then the second day you are given time and you are given tools and you are given ideas to make your own plan. Uh, students get together and create climate action plans for their institutions, um, which will uh, encourage their institutions to become carbon neutral. Uh, in many cases, sometimes sort of smaller steps like getting into recycling or creating a, a green team or developing a campus garden. And it is such a great feeling to have passionate people around you and be in this environment where everyone is so excited to be here and they all want to accomplish the common goal. The Youth Summit is, is a spectacular event. It's eye-opening on so many levels. It's in this beautiful facility that they so graciously let us use. It gives us a chance to sort of share what institutions are doing, um, you know, high school to high school, college to high school, college to college. From a teacher's perspective, this is the greatest thing that I do every year because we get to walk away with a plan for our district and students are extremely inspired and motivated to work towards positive change. And then at the end, right now, everyone is meeting and we're talking about ways to bring it back to our school. We've also gone to our school board and presented great ideas to them, which they've, they've fallen in love with. Yeah, the energy is contagious and it creates a word of mouth epidemic amongst us. We go back and we share with those that have not been here, try to create the passion and the excitement. It, it, there's, there's no, we can't do this here. The word can't is not in the Climate Summit vocabulary. Definitely like the just like the growing enthusiastic interest in trying to decrease our um, carbon footprint. I think that's something that's really like uniting everyone here. I mean, like I said, it educates people and it's just going to help everyone change. I'll try to change. It's something that if every kid in this, in this country could experience, they'd love it just as much as I do. I think more students should get involved so we can, because we're the future changed my life a little bit because I didn't really know what I wanted to be when I grew up. That was kind of answered when I came here and I realized I don't really have any other option. This is what I need to do. This, this is my purpose here. So why would you want to convene a Youth Climate Summit? So when the Wild Hunter first um, started thinking about convening a Youth Climate Summit, we wanted to take an approach that was um, not a non-advocacy approach and really um, think about how we could um, create a, um, an opportunity for youth to come together and have self-defined action. We hope that um, the summit would involve, inspire, and engage youth and it would be a way for us to work with, um, to work with youth that typically are not usually part of the, at least the museum community between the ages of you know, 14 to uh, young adults that are in college. So this was a great pathway for us to engage an audience we hadn't engaged yet. Um, it's also um, become a way to create pathways to green jobs and create new partnerships with scientists, businesses, and community groups. Uh, we really wanted to create a way in which to bring youth as stakeholders to the table and um, be relevant in, connect in our work in connecting communities. Overarching um, all of this is thinking about how to create a um, how to create a climate literate uh, generation um, that really um, and using and this NOAA has a great uh, climate literacy um, actually climate.gov is an amazing resource and we really took that um, to heart in thinking about the creating a summit that would work towards creating a climate literate generation. So that was um, ultimately the aim of the summit and looking at climate change at multiple scales, both local, regional, and global. So the learning goals, um, we wanted to help youth understand the economic, ecological, and consequences of climate change at a local and global scale and learn strategies to respond to climate change in the Adirondacks or really you know, at any location where a summit is held to develop a climate action plan to implement in their schools and communities and really taking
making that plan from start to finish. There's all really a, all types of 21st century learning skills that are incorporated into that, as well as developing leadership and communication skills. So what is the Adirondack Climate Summit? Um, we held our summit two, for two days in November at the Wild Center in northern New York State, um, attracting about 30 teams of students, administrative, and uh, facility staff. So that's about 30, roughly 30 um, to 32 schools, both high schools and colleges, that come in um, that come in teams of about six to seven. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a minute. Uh, we offered over 20 hands-on workshops and plenary sessions. We provided many opportunities for networking, um, poster sessions, um, pop-up success stories, creating a climate action plan, and certainly incorporating a lot of fun. And as we move through the webinar today, we're really going to dive into these, each of these pieces in more detail. Um, but just to take a moment to walk you through the structure, um, the students arrive in the morning. We typically get started around, around um, 8 or 9 o'clock. We kick off with an icebreaker. Um, we spend time in our main theater, which seats around 165, and we have a way that we can stream it um, to other places in our museum. Um, and really, that first day is about grounding in grounding youth in uh, the science of climate change. Um, and then we have a lot of workshops. So there's um, five, three sessions of five concurrent workshops happening. Um, and then we spend time um, together on day two, also um, in the theater, but it's really about planning that day and the networking. So the poster sessions, the networking, and creating a climate action plan all um, start on day two. Um, the summit is student-driven. Um, we work directly uh, with the schools to uh, work with local schools to develop a team of a youth steering committee, uh, which you see pictured here. And uh, it's really a, a group of students, teachers, community members, Wild Center staff. In addition, I work directly with sustainability coordinators at participating colleges. Um, we meet once a week for about 16 weeks after school um, during the club time at one of the schools, which is really critical because you have to go to where the students actually are. Um, and that is not without our challenges. We're in a very rural area, and so um, the schools are typically anywhere from 10, 20, 40 miles apart. Um, so sometimes there are issues with busing and transportation. Uh, as you can see, um, we're in a very rural area in northern New York State, um, in the heart of the Adirondack Park. Um, and again, it's around 32 teams that uh, attend. And um, it roughly totals about 200 people. So now the plenary sessions. Our plenary sessions um, bring together the best regional climate scientists to help understand local impacts along with the global. But we also um, want to represent um, all the different cultures that make up our region. Um, this is a group from uh, the Aquasasne Mohawk tribe. We've also had artists, the US Green Building Center, Center for Green Schools, educators, businesses, um, corporate leaders, uh, nonprofits, musicians, to represent a full range of perspectives. Farmers, too. <laughs> uh, we, as I mentioned, we um, have 15 different workshops. And they're very, um, the students um, help us determine those themes. And they're very experiential and innovative. Um, so we really try to focus on different concepts related to climate uh, and energy literacy, so transportation, recycling, school and local gardening, energy efficiency, green building design are, are just like um, a small sample of the types of workshops that we offer. Uh, we also use our building. So the Wild Center is a silver lead certified building. So we explore concepts in energy, solar power, biomass, uh, waste management by using the actual building itself as a teaching tool. Go ahead. Um, I mentioned before the poster session. This is a, a wonderful opportunity for schools to showcase the work that they have done, as well as get ideas from each other. <coughs> we also plan an open space. So um, this is the unconference part of the conference, uh, and it really um, allows the opportunity for 
students to drive the topics. And um, as we get into the toolkit um, section of the webinar, I'll explain how we actually make this happen. But it's an exciting way to do this. The center of the, um, the climate summit is actually creating a climate action plan. And so um, this is a very core section of the, of the program where we have students working together to create this climate action plan that provides a framework for them to take back to their schools. Um, and it's really student driven. So the students are working together in their teams, um, oftentimes with their teachers, sometimes their superintendents, faculty or administrators are also involved in this process, as well as facility managers to help to decide um, what goals they have for the, um, what goals they have. So these are just examples of schools working in teams. Um, so, and I, again, all of these materials, when we get it, go into the toolkit, are available um, for free online. Um, so as you can see here, this is our local school where the Wild Center is located in Tupper Lake, New York. And they came up with this huge list. And then they'll take that list and they'll prioritize that and think about it over the course of a full of a full year or longer. So we do ask them to kind of push out and think about the plan um, over a couple years. One of the things that's really important in the climate action processing is, uh, or the climate action planning is to um, make sure that there are projects that the schools can be successful at. So projects such as um, put solar panels on our roof is really an amazing um, concept but that might take a couple years to have happen. So are there smaller projects such as you know, terracycling or a field trip or bringing in new speakers or thinking about a school garden that the students that can take on um, and, work on, and work on a small project to start and then build up to those bigger projects. We also try to have a lot of fun too. So that's a very important element. And as, I, um, as we get into what makes a successful um, successful summit. We actually uh, learned about including fun the hard, not the hard way, but it was a learning curve for us. Um, we, um, we were very serious in the beginning, and, and we uh, lightened up a bit. This is uh, Mark Kimball from Essex Farm, who, who is uh, an incredible farmer, but also a, um, a performer, as you can see from his uh, torch juggling and drum sets. <laughs> um, the last part of the summit includes the summit finale. And so this is a performance-based, generally performance-based part of the summit where um, the students have decided when oftentimes written original music. Um, they come up with a program on this uh, slideshow. Um, maybe they've written um, an essay or poetry that they're going to perform as part of, kind of the hopeful message of the summit and a call to action. So as I mentioned, um, we had a pretty steep learning curve um, when we started this project six years ago. Uh, we've certainly learned a lot, and we are six years smarter, but we are definitely still learning. And one of the things I'm excited about with working on getting summits started in other areas is that um, uh, hopefully all of you on the phone and others out there will think about how we can um, learn from each other and create a platform um, for exchanging ideas. Um, so at the very beginning, we had way too many lectures. The first summit, um, you know, we, we probably had four plenary sessions in a row in our theater space, and we knew and we realized after that that just wasn't going to work for the, this audience. So we really um, bumped up the hands-on and interactive workshops, and we um, really lightened things up. Um, so that would include, um, you know, adding humor, a green photo booth, um, door prizes, uh, playlists that students created so there would be music during breaks, um, and tried to create um, a lot of different ways to uh, learn the climate science but also to in enjoy being there. Um, we also assumed at the beginning that science was the only entry point, and this was something um, that was a huge learning curve for us, and we really started to integrate the arts, performance, um, music as message, videos from the student's perspective, um, and definitely a stronger cultural tie-in, um, bringing in environmental justice, um, our Native American community, were really critical shifts for us. And a lot of that we learned from the summit evaluations and from debriefing with our uh, Youth Summit Steering Committee um, so we could make, make those changes. We definitely are still rooted in the science, but we found other entry points to get there. Um, 
and it's been a much richer summit since we started to incorporate all of those. Um, vetting the speakers, so making sure, um, finding speakers that had, um, were able to talk to youth between the ages of 14 and in the early 20s. So, um, you know, you really want um, people that can be very engaging. Um, relinquishing control, so uh, I realized the first couple of summits that I was standing at the podium a lot and talking, and, and I just started handing that all over to the student steering committee and um, having them help contact the speakers and having them take on more and more of a leadership role and that worked for, for everyone. And, and that was a great, it was a great thing, but it was definitely something I had to learn to do. Um, and the evaluation piece, as I mentioned before, was huge um, because it helped us um, create new themes for the summit as well as build in um, new tracks like youth leadership. So now I'd like to invite uh, Tammy Morgan and um, she's going to talk to you uh, a little bit more about our outcomes and impacts. Welcome everyone. I'm thrilled to be here in our nation's capital on Earth Day and I want to thank everyone for joining us. My name is Tammy Morgan and I've been on the steering committee since its inception and I currently teach AP Environmental Science and Biology at the Lake Placid High School in northern New York. This is a photo of me on Axel Heiberg Island in the Canadian Arctic where I studied life in extreme environments as part of a NASA spaceward bound Arctic expedition. Prior to teaching, however, I worked as a research assistant studying CD8 T cells for several years. And in addition to education, I have degrees in cell biology and environmental science. As a researcher, I felt unfulfilled and I felt that my lens was too small that I was looking at the world with and, and that I was missing something. I wanted to get outside and teaching environmental science allowed me to do that. So I left the lab and became a teacher. While that may sound really impressive, I think it's important to know that I am a member of the climate illiterate generation. Like most people that grew up in the 80s, I never heard about climate change in school, never learned about it, and relied on the media to teach me. Probably not a great idea. When I first started teaching, I felt ill-equipped to cover what appeared at the time to be a controversial topic. The Youth Summit introduced me to climate experts in my region. It gave me the tools and the confidence that I needed to tackle climate literacy. Now, armed with IPCC reports, NOAA's databases, and years of Youth Summit experiences, the debate is over and my entire curriculum has been, become more meaningful as I look at it through a climate lens. <clears throat> So in this section of the presentation, I'm going to talk about what happens after the summit and, and try to give you a, an idea of the impact that youth summits have had in our schools and communities. After six summits, we've helped support and create green teams from over 50 high schools, private schools, and colleges, and hosted over 800 participants. In any given year, however, that climate act, the climate action plans developed by those teams has the potential to impact over 25,000 students, which to me is a really impressive number. It's what happens when they take it home to their own schools. So we're building capacity, and every school has a different plan, and every year for every school is different because we have different students. And the types of projects range from holding bottle drives to starting school gardens and developing regional organics recycling programs. One of the most important outcomes of, of the summit, summit has to do with the networks that have been created. A perfect example of networking that was created in our region was the Adirondack Farm to School Initiative. This is a spin-off organization created by members of the Youth Summit Steering Committee in an effort to support school gardens and increase fresh local produce in a school cafeteria. Through the collaborative efforts of that program, they were awarded a USDA Farm to School Planning Grant for over $44,000. And each year, one of the themes that the students seem to really link onto and, and, and grasp is the, the concept of a school garden. That's a doable, measurable outcome that the students feel that they can accomplish and want to accomplish in their time at, at um, the table. At the Youth Summit, students, teachers, and farmers connect in a very organic way. As a result of those grassroots efforts, 60 to 70 percent of Adirondack Youth Climate Summit schools now have gardens. And you're looking at a couple of pictures of the gardens that have been in our, this right here, sorry. Um, 
this is a picture of our elementary school garden, and the harvests that you're looking at were featured in our school cafeteria. And that, those connections were a direct result of students learning about and connecting with resources in the area, local farmers that could help them turn this into a reality. Uh, networks have been created between schools, within schools, and between students and their and community groups. These students tapped over 400 maple trees to produce maple syrup that they then sold to support their local youth center. A lot of farmers have participated in the summit, and the farmers that do participate in our workshops each year connect in a very direct way with students who then bring their families to the table. And many of those families are signing up to become community-supported agriculture members. So we're impacting consumer choices in the region by bringing the youth to the table and, and connecting them to people who can then take it to the next level. Student volunteers participate in community events across the region and are actively putting on workshops themselves. So once they learn how to participate in workshops, they, they want to take it to other audiences and then teach what they've learned. Other, another really exciting network has been formed around the, the theme of recycling and composting. Networking between the schools has had a significant impact on waste management and waste reduction in our region. Before the youth summit, most of the schools in our region did not have any recycling programs. At first, uh, at the first summit, Tupper Lake students and teachers connected with Casella Waste Management. They became the first school in the region to implement a zero start recycling program. And in the first year, they documented their savings. And, and after they realized that they saved thousands of dollars, they wanted to share their results at the next summit. Our students at Lake Placid used the data that the students from Tupper Lake had presented to convince our school board to try zero start recycling as well. As a result, many schools in our region now have recycling programs, and Casella Waste Management has since become one of our main sponsors of the event. There are many more examples of networking between schools. Students are getting all kinds of ideas from other students. If you can go back to the slide with the, the dress, there you go, thank you. Um, this is an example, if you're looking in the corner there, Jump to Funk was a program that was started at one of our college members, the North Country Community College. Their, um, they presented their the results, or they presented information about their, their dance and, and talked about how much fun they had, and it sparked a lot of similar events. So through student networking, many students have hosted Earth Day dances with Bike powered lights and love your earth dances where you can't, you're not allowed in the door unless you, if you are wearing anything new. You have to wear something old or recycled. Uh, students in this picture made a dress out of recycled aluminum. There have been students going to the prom wearing dresses made out of duct tape. It's really been inspirational. And, and you're seeing that artistic side come out of the students. Students collected gently used items at the end of the year locker clean out day as well. And uh, they turned that into a business. They turned recycling it into a business at Tupper Lake. They donated the school supplies that they um, collected that day to students in need in the fall of the next year. So you can see each year students share ideas with other schools, and the action plans build on the success of previous years. Increases in school gardens have led to the need for more soil, which then inspired students to start composting projects. And it, it keeps following. Each year, you build upon what you did the year before. Uh, other waste reduction initiatives on the next slide include um, campaigns to reduce plastic. The students in Saranac Lake created a plan by um, a, a plan to get rid of plastic bags in, their, bags in their community. And so they began by writing grants to get money to help fund the um, a, a Canvas bag program, and they went to community stores and handed them out for free to people in the community to help spread that message. All of these new initiatives and ideas require administrative support. So a lot of times these students start showing up at school board presentations, at school board meetings, and giving presentations to pitch their ideas for things like plastic bottle refilling stations and hosting community events like the ones shown here. Next slide. 
A major outcome of the summit has been providing exposure to a variety of green careers. And you're going to listen to some students in a few minutes and uh, who have, have been impacted by the summit and are thinking about careers that they might not have thought of as green careers, but they're bringing their climate literacy knowledge to the table and, and realizing that all careers can become green careers. So this is an example. One of the most exciting benefits of hosting youth summits is this exposure and the experience that students get to a variety of options. They begin to understand that climate change is not about doom and gloom. It's about regenerative change and business opportunities and creating this opportunity. These students raised environmental club funds by selling jewelry that they made out of recycled magazines and garlic bulbs and mint tea that they harvested from their garden. They're learning about business, they're learning about marketing, and they're learning about leadership. Next slide. After connecting with farmers and going on farm trips, many of the summiteers are considering fields in sustainable agriculture, and they're spending time in the summer working on those farms and learning as much as they can. Students are particularly excited about renewable energy technologies as they learn about them at the summit. The National Bioenergy Bioproducts Education Program educators have been facilitating summit workshops for the past three years. They have many resources for not just students, but teachers as well, that encourage students to think outside of the box when it comes to energy resources. The Department of Energy's Essential Principles and Fundamental Concepts of Energy Literacy are another great resource for teachers. And I've been talking about all the networking that the students are doing, but the networking that's happening between the teachers is equally as exciting. And um, we're creating a generation where we're changing climate illiterate teachers into climate literate teachers, which is really the first step in doing this. And I think that's what the National Bioenergy Bioproducts Education Program is all about, modeling, um, creating teachers to teach teachers. Um, an example of, of how students are really excited about bioenergy and anything that involves renewable energy technologies, the students and teachers from the Adirondack Regional Vocational Education Center are building a biodiesel production program as part of their climate action plan this year. They've already received grant funding for the project and are excited about turning waste oil from their culinary arts program into fuel for their auto tech program. Many students that are interested in science are also interested in engineering as a potential um, job outcome in the end. And the networking that they gain from meeting college professors and students by attending the summits and working with programs like the BBEP that I just mentioned are encouraging students to solve problems from a whole systems approach. Instead of thinking linearly, linearly they're, they're looking at problems that attack an issue, or looking at solutions to problems by attacking it holistically. The um, students in, in our region particip are participating in, in a regional biodigester project. This project, which recently received a regional development grant from the state of New York, will convert food waste from the region into renewable biogas energy for the community, for the, the town. Um, you know, at first, a lot of the pro plans and climate action plans and climate outcomes that were coming out of the summit were small little things that were happening in the school. And then it became bigger community events and regional events bringing together all of the teams. And they're, they're networking a lot more between the different green teams in the region. They're, they're coming together and collaborating in a way that was never possible and, and would not have happened without the youth summit. Next slide, please. Students also learn a little bit about uh, conservation biology and what it's like to be a field biologist. Workshops at the summit teach students about field work and managing invasive species, a problem that is often exas exacerbated by climate change. As Jen mentioned, we've, we've added a, a lot more outlets for including creative arts and performance, and the students' climate action plans often include aspects of this. Students are learning that their music and art can help spread their climate action message. This student wrote his own song about climate justice and performed it in front of the entire school during an AIDS program 
which Jen will talk to you about a little bit further when she talks about the Alliance for Climate Education. When we talk about um, climate educational resources later, you'll learn more about how that program works. Next slide. I think one of the most valuable issues, or one of the most valuable outcomes is the fact that we're creating leaders for the next generation. Youth leadership is an important part of, of all youth climate summits. The Youth Steering Committee provides opportunities for students to step up and learn leadership skills, organizing, public speaking, writing and communication, including media, having group decision making processes, working in collaborative environments. We've had many students take this uh, head on. And Caroline, Do Caroline Dodd that you're seeing there is, has been a, a member of the Youth Summit Steering Committee for, many, for several years. She's now a high school senior in Saranac Lake. And she was selected to attend the UN Climate Talks last September in New York City. Sharing these experiences with students at the Youth Summit in a plenary session inspired a lot of other students to really think about potential leadership roles in the future. And, and um, many students who I think had never considered careers in politics and policy and government, they're, they're starting to think that that's something that, that might fit for them. Another good example of leadership, if you could go to the next slide, is um, a, one of our most famous summiteers, <laughs> Gina Fiorelli. She participated all through high school as a summit leader and has applied her leadership skills in college. This year, she started the Vermont Youth Climate Summit at the University of Vermont, as, where, where she now, which she now attends. And this resulted in her being selected as a climate education and literacy climate champion through the White House Office of Science and Technology. So as a science teacher, I'm particularly interested in, in knowing whether or not the Youth Summit is actually teaching them the science that they need to tackle these issues. And at the end of the day, a successful climate summit will increase climate literacy. That is our ultimate goal, as we stated in the beginning. So we use a pre and post student assessment to determine if they have actually learned some of the science at the end of our day two, our two day summit. And statistical analysis shows that of those results showed that knowledge of climate issues and science, both at a global and local level, were increased by 40 percent. The impact goes way beyond learning science standards, however. Students are engaged and inspired to use that knowledge to solve problems and increase awareness around them. They often do this by hosting events, Earth Day events, Arbor Day celebrations. Student-driven events include everything from e-waste drives to Earth Day dances and Earth Day celebrations. As soon as I'm done today, I'll be rushing home to help my students put on the biggest student-run Earth Week event in the history of Lake Placid. Our event will feature two big bands climate scientists, a bonfire, Native American spirit dances, local organic food and vendors, electric bikes, a bike smoothie machine, and much, much more. All of the connections that were made and all of the ideas were completely student-driven. This, this is their event, not mine. The fact that I am here and they're <laughs> there dealing with all of the issues and answering all of the phone calls means that they're the leaders in this. They don't need me. I'm just the facilitator, which in the, at the end of the day is what I want to be. The Youth Summit teams from five different schools are going to help us put this event on. The celebration is free and open to the public, so if you're in the Lake Placid region, please join us tomorrow <laughs> on the Lake Placid Oval from 7 to 10. Students raised over $1,100 to host this event. They coordinated with town and local governments. They had to communicate with the fire department and the DEC and are learning valuable event management and marketing skills. All of the climate action plans include educational outreach. And the event that you just, we were just talking about is an example of that. But others, sometimes students want to take their message beyond their own community. And um, students are educational outreach plans and range from presenting to school boards, to talking to their peers, writing articles for school newspapers, hosting assemblies, and much more. Sometimes students end up farther afield. After learning about environmental justice, the student in the picture, Carly Garrett, 
was inspired to volunteer in Kenya to build school gardens at an orphanage. And while she was there, she actually had to design learning plans and a unit plan for the school so that they could, um, that, that was part of her educational plan was teaching the students while she was there. So my school is in Lake Placid, which is a winter Olympic village, and that means that many of my students are winter athletes. We love to celebrate winter no matter how cold it gets. We have losers, cross-country skiers, snowboarders, hockey players, and ski jumpers. The students were greatly impacted this year by the science presented by one of the climate scientists from Paul Smith College at this year's summit named Dr. Kurt Steger. Using data presented in his plenary session, this year's team has been working to create a series of social media campaigns relating climate change, relating climate change impacts to their winter sports. One of our students is a ski jumper, and he put his GoPro camera on, and Lucy and I support climate action. All right, in closure, uh, I've been involved in a lot of really amazing projects in my life, but this is the one that has changed my life. By viewing climate change through the eyes of youth, I no longer think of climate change as an insurmountable problem. I see it as an opportunity for regenerative growth. Knowing that I am helping to prepare a climate and energy literate generation gives me a sense of fulfillment that gives me gives meaning to my life and my career and what I'm doing, meaning that I never experienced when I was working in the lab. So I've been extremely inspired by our summit, and Jen now is going to talk to you about summits in other places. So there have been uh, youth climate summits happening um, in other places uh, around the country. Um, this summit, the Boston Youth Can Summit, actually um, started about seven years ago and is uh, run by the uh, Boston Latin School. And um, our team um, from the Adirondack Youth Climate Summit um, actually was able to join um, last year and present about the art, what we do in our program. Uh, and it was really great. And we're headed there again at the end of May with another team of students. So building on that network um, has been really exciting. Um, one of the summits that was directly inspired by the Youth Climate Program um, was a food day summit um, that actually happened, um, another summit that happened in northern New York that focused on climate resiliency around the issue of local food. So um, we've been uh, working with them. Many of our summiteer uh, teams attend this program as well. And so there's a lot of crossover and a lot of cross-pollination um, across northern New York um, on this movement, and this also uh, contributed to getting our new Adirondack Farm to School initiative happening. Uh, we had re alluded to this earlier, um, the Vermont Youth Climate Summit, which was hosted at UVM this past uh, December, was a direct result of um, some of your Gina Fiorelli, who graduated from Saranac Lake and then went on to be a freshman at um, at UVM. Um, our team again went over there and we're hoping to bring um, students from Vermont to our summit again in uh, November. So there's, um, that was also a very big youth climate summit. Um, there were 27 school teams from across the state. It was a one-day summit, so it's slightly different, so a different model. And it focused, um, it was very interesting, they focused on pairing, um, the college students actually did all the planning and the college students were paired with local businesses to come up with the content for their workshops. Um, they had a separate track for teachers, and 
they also um, included an element of the climate action planning. So they took our plan and then um, you know, adjusted it for their summit, which was uh, a great way and a great twist on, um, on climate, on youth climate summits. And they're also planning a youth climate summit for this coming year. Uh, we also are very happy to be working with the Detroit Youth Climate Summit. So um, Detroiters Working for Environmental Justice, the Detroit Climate Action Collaborative, and the Michigan Science Center are, joint, are teaming up to work on a youth climate summit. Um, the uh, Detroit Climate Action Collaborative is leading the development of the city of Detroit's first climate action plan, and Detroit is working on um, bringing together um, youth to have a voice in that climate action plan, which I think is really exciting. Um, they have a strong emphasis on green, uh, green jobs and working um, to envision uh, climate solutions for Detroit and the role of youth in creating those solutions. So we're very excited to um, be working with them on their, the next phase of their summits. There's also summits being planned in uh, Seattle uh, between the Woodland Park Zoo, the Pacific Science Center, and the Seattle Aquarium for October of uh, 2015. And another group um, in the southern part of New York State in the Catskills is working on a youth climate summit for 2016. So now I'd like to turn this over to Meadow Hackett. Hi everybody, I'm Meadow Hackett. I'm a senior accounting and finance major with an international business minor at the Villanova School of Business just outside Philadelphia. But I'm originally from Saranac Lake. Um, it's just it's very close to the Wild Center. I was part of the inaugural Youth Climate Summit in 2009 as a team member and volunteer as well as member of the steering committee in 2010. My first year, I worked on the summit planning committee planning interactive activities for participants and serve as part of the team for Saranac Lake High School, where I aided in creating my high school's first climate action plan. In 2010, I acted on the steering committee as a student leader and operated as spokesperson for the summit. So through the summit, I developed valuable leadership and communication skills by speaking not only during plenary sessions, but also with press for print, radio, and television. Uh, the value of the youth the Youth Climate Summit really introduced me to climate change. It helped me to learn and understand sustainability, waste management, community gardens, and much more. There really isn't anything that can rival the student experience of the summit, because you not only gain useful information about the climate, but you have the ability to connect with other students who have powerful ideas and goals. So the value of the Youth Climate Summit is really derived through the way presentations are made the exchange of ideas. Climate discussions are so often tainted with negative worst case scenario data, and rather than feel inspired, many feel discouraged. However, this is not the case with the Youth Summit. The value of young voices speaking out for change is immeasurably motivating. So through my involvement with the summit, I was afforded the opportunity to travel to Herica Science Center in Helsinki, Finland, as part of a museum exchange with the Wild Center. I was a student ambassador in Finland and took part in the initial conversations for the Finnish Youth Climate Summit. The purpose of the project was to facilitate an exchange of experiences between local communities in Finland and the Adirondacks, discussing community learning and action on energy saving, climate issues, and green practices, supporting the region's commitment to sustainability. During my time in Finland, I made presentations in Finnish class classrooms and met students. In just over a week, I not only increased my climate literacy, but I also connected with the Finnish lifestyle, culture, and made new friends. The Finnish seemed to have everything in line that we, as Americans, are still just beginning to grasp, including a general consciousness of climate change and a willingness to adapt. This mentality, partnered with a long-standing relationship and respect for the environment embedded in the Finnish culture, was unlike anything I had ever experienced. So for several years, we've continued to grow our relationship with the Herica Science Museum, and they decided to hold their own Youth Climate Summit. So we helped mentor them in the planning process, and they've now held summits for three years. And so for several years, we've highlighted the work of other students our age around the world particularly in Finland. And you can see in this image, students are Skyping with the 
uh, we're Skyping with the Finnish during one of our plenary sessions at the Youth Summit. So students tell us that this global connection really reinforces that uh, students are not alone in their mission to act on climate change. And a lot tell us that they did not realize that there are other students around the world in our generation concerned and working towards change. So it's really been enlightening for us. So looking toward the future, well, if there's one thing that I can say, it's that I had no idea that when I attended the Youth Summit six years ago that I would still be here talking about it six years later. When I attended the summit, there was a green jobs panel that really resonated with me. Because the panel participants were not all scientists or educators. They held positions at hotels, worked as chefs, or at database management firms. The, the options were many. This idea really traveled with me, and I accepted it as a sort of challenge. So as I look towards my college graduation in just a few, few short weeks, many asked, how is accounting in any way great? So in the fall, I'll be starting in the audit practice at Deloitte, but I don't plan to settle because I know that I can make a green job part of my professional endeavors. I'm planning to take my accounting background and move into a newer field called climate change and sustainability reporting that has already begun to affect transparency, the way investors view businesses, and the way corporations operate. Um, I remember that my experiences with the summit were arguably the most rewarding and impactful experiences of my high school career. So it's really, the summit really enables students to live out three C's, choice, chance, and change. Students can make the choice to take the chance to ignite change in their schools and regions, and it's really inspiring. The summit has acted as a catalyst for green movement, movements within schools across the Adirondack Park and northern New York as a whole. And I have no doubt in the potential of the immense impact that more summits across the globe could bring. So I'm going to transition back to Jen right now so she can tell you more. Thanks, Meadow. Um, so now we're going to get into a little bit about what makes a successful Youth Climate Summit. And um, I want to show you the toolkit um, the toolkit, and uh, really um, what we've learned is that um, it really takes involving that core group of students in all aspects of planning, organizing, leading, and hosting the Youth Climate Summit to make it truly student-driven. So working with that group of about 20 to 30 students to help you, um, for us, has been critical in helping us um, empower and encourage that youth leadership. Um, finding those multiple points um, of entry into the conversation. We've talked a lot about it moving across disciplines, and that's been very critical. Um, the team aspect of having this, those teams of students attend from the schools, so six to seven students, including um, faculty, um, administrative or facility staff person also coming, um, are, it's very important for us to make that um, make that happen, and um, it's important for the schools because they have those representatives, and that way we can include more teams. Um, for us, that was also in part the size of our institution. Um, we could fit around 250 people, so we, had, we wanted to have many schools attend, so the teams was a great um, solution. Um, it's also providing the opportunity for students to showcase their work. So whether you do it as a poster session, presentations, networking, um, multiple ways for the students to have that voice and to share their own ideas is really critical. Building in multiple opportunities for the teams to work together, so having set time for them to work on a climate action plan is also really important. Um, and this, of course, treating everyone with respect and listening to student and teacher ideas. Um, having that passionate group of um, teachers and uh, the committee that helps organize the summit is, is really, um, really critical. So, um, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. So this is a snapshot of the Wild Center's uh, Youth Climate Summit Toolkit website. Um, we um, have it set up so that each, it's almost like it's each content block is a page, and there's multiple links within each of those content blocks to take you to all the forms that you need, timelines, logistics, and, and I'm going to talk through some of this, but I wanted you to see the actual page um, that's, right on our, uh, that's right on our website. 
Um, so that's what that looks like. Uh, we're going to walk through some of this checklist in a little bit more detail in this next section. Um, so I've talked a lot about this steering committee and um, really it's um, finding that group of students, those teachers, possibly community members, partner organizations, and your staff that can work together and lead the process of organizing the summit is really critical. Um, we meet uh, once a week um, during the planning phase um, for about uh, 16 weeks. Um, to make this happen, and usually that translates, I figured this out, to roughly a thousand volunteer hours um, is what this group puts in in total. Um, so it's a lot of time over the course of a year. So they're a very uh, crucial part of the, of the summit. Um, we refer to our student leaders as the summiteers. Um, having um, a, a few teachers that are part of this team is also really critical. As you can see, uh, Tammy Morgan's been involved um, on this project since it's uh, very, very inception, and uh, I really couldn't do it without her. Um, she's that liaison to the school um, and to the students and helps, um, helps manage and organize the student steering committee to work on jobs um, during the course of the year and to implement all the, the projects. Um, the other thing to think about is the partnerships that you want to reach out to. Are there other organizations in your area that might have resources or assets that you don't have? that can help you um, either with speakers or leverage some level of um, organi organization or coordinating um, that can bring resources to the table and help you um, provide, um, provide the best summit that you can. The audience. Um, the summits are really about education. That doesn't guarantee that schools are going to jump right on board. Um, it's really demonstrating that a Youth Climate Summit will deliver an exceptional experience that's consistent with the schools or colleges existing goals and needs as necessary. And we suggest, you know, I worked directly um, at the, those first few years of the summit with um, principals, superintendents, um, calling um, the, you know, environmental science teachers at the local college, finding out if they have sustainability coordinators. And then, so there's a lot of groundwork that will get laid in your first year to help make it easier. Everything's easier the second time around. So that, that first year, you really will um, learn a lot, but make a lot of amazing connections. Um, and then working uh, with teachers that are either, maybe they're teaching biology or earth science, um, or just possibly AP environmental science. Maybe the school already has an environmental club, and that's a connection in. Um, and it's also important to underscore the summit's alignment with existing state and national academic achievement metrics, such as um, the Common Core of the Next Generation Science Standards. Um, so our school teams, which I've mentioned several times now, are um, made up of um, you know five to six students plus uh, teachers or faculty. We've um, we send out separate invitations to colleges or to the um, principals and superintendents to invite them to attend with their teams or stop by for lunch or find entry points to involve that administration. It really helps with uh, buy-in. Um, we've made the decision early on to involve colleges. Uh, some of the summits that are currently happening um, don't do that, and it really, you know, it's, up, it's totally up to you. Um, you know, we also, the Finland Summit, for instance, um, typically reaches uh, what would be the equivalent of like ninth and 10th graders, and our teams tend to be a little bit older, like juniors and seniors. Um, so working for us, working with the colleges has been a great benefit. Um, it brings in another uh, level of uh, expertise. Um, we oftentimes get um, colleges uh, leading some of the workshops, so that's been a great benefit, or the professors from those colleges are, are leading workshops or um, part of the plenary session. They, plenary session. Um, they also, the high school students get to uh, work with the college students and all the different networking and workshop sessions that we've, we um, kind of create and set up, and that's really important. They get exposed to colleges, they get exposed to career tracks and pathways, and so for us, involving colleges made a good make, was a good choice. Um, also, I guess I should mention that over the last six years, uh, we've had high school students that were part of the Youth Climate Summit graduate from high school, go to college, and then bring, get their college involved. So that was been another thing that's been exciting um, about the, the college piece. So this looks a little unwieldy, and we're not going to go through I promise we won't go through this, but this is also 
in the logistics block on the toolkit page. And it's just a timeline. So figuring out, these were all the things we had to figure out. And I set up a workflow so I can manage um, my time and um, also know when I need to start doing things. So this is there for you to use as a checklist and to um, um, you know, tweak, of course, as you would. But um, you, sh it, you should count on organizing to organize with your steering committee. And by that, I mean really having um, somebody like a teacher working with you and planning that time to help the students, mentor the students to um, reach out and, and make those real community partnerships and to do the planning part of the summit. Um, budget and fundraising. So um, we seek outside support to help defray the cost of our summit. Um, really, our fundraising model um, is about two-thirds individual support and about a third corporate support. Um, we get support from a waste management company, um, and they've been involved with us for the last three years. We've also um, had in-kind um, in -kind contributions, such as some food has been donated. We get our local Ben and Jerry's involved, and they come and set up an ice cream stand during the summit, with this, which the students love. Uh, we get reduced rates on hotel rooms because our students are summits two days and many of our students travel um, from two to three hours away in our rural area. And materials are donated in kind or heavily discounted. Um, having both financial and in-kind gifts is the key to building capacity and support for the event. We've also um, been successful in crowdfunding as well as using Giving Tuesday. So um, establishing that summit budget and we actually have an example of this on, online, and you can see, you know, again, our summit, um, you know, this is over the last six years building this summit. I'm not going to go through all this now, but it's there on the toolkit so you can see those costs. Um, one of the things for us with having a two-day summit is we um, have five meals that we serve for 250 people at each time. So that's a big um, chunk of our cost. Um, and also speaker honorariums. And as the summit has grown, the budget has grown because we try to bring speakers in from farther away. We've t I touched a little bit on those plenary and workshops. It's really important to have a mix. Opportunities to bring all the whole group together as well as have interactive workshops. So our museum, the Wild Center, is actually closed during the two days of the summit because we hold it in November and we're um, kind of quiet time of year for us in the mountains. And so we can do that. And um, we don't have like a classroom space, but we transform our whole institution into a conference center. Um, so we have tables set up in front of um, our um, aquariums, um, you know, in front of our, in our cafe or in front of our store. We just take over everything. Um, so that's how we actually make that, um, make that work. Um, and it's also really important um, to communicate with the speakers. So as part of this um, section on the toolkit, you'll see, um, you'll see uh, workshop um, communication like leader expectations. And so working with your workshop and plenary leaders to help them understand that a high school and college audience might be a little bit different and um, giving them some um, uh, feedback on the types of presentations that work well um, and how you can uh, how they can um, have a really great presentation for their for their uh, groups is incredibly important so there's a lot of things in that section including um, workshop with your expectations facilitator guidelines confirmation letters um, and uh, other pieces that you can take a look look at on that toolkit website um, I walked through at the very beginning the kind of the, the agenda, and just so you can see, um, you know, it really we have a, a sample agendas I believe from all um, all at least uh, five of the five years. Um, so you can see how it evolved and changed, and how we structured the day. Um, it was all very in, intentional. So uh, we we uh, really work hard on on making that agenda work and balancing um, where when the workshops happen. Another big part of this is our communication with the participants um, from getting that save the date out five months out to um, registration to using things like SurveyMonkey for, we actually use SurveyMonkey for other registration tool. Um, and we also use it as a follow-up to do evaluation with the school six months out and get a um, progress report. Um, 
all everything uh, that I'm showing you right now is actually on um, on the toolkit. You can download the agendas. And I'm again, I'm just going to re. I'll say this at the end, but we are happy to work with anyone on helping to plan a sub summit and share all of our materials, you know, freely. I mean, I'm happy to, to spend um, a lot of time with you on that. So this. Um, this section, the communication is really important. Everything from like photo consent forms, which is really important um, when you're working with students um, under 18, um, to school expectations and uh, resources for schools. Uh, open space, um, another portion of our summit is um, about an hour, actually, 45 minutes to an hour. I mentioned this before. So this is the unconference part of the conference. The students um, suggest topics, and then they meet, and then we choose generally between 10 and 15 of those topics, and those students lead those conversations. So we've had everything from um, hunting and climate change to this one was friend raising, um, music. We had actually a group that uh, worked together to write a song during this time frame. So it's really again an opportunity to network and link students together um, in a really in a creative way. Um, the posters and pop-ups have spoken about this already, but we invite schools to participate. It creates great networking opportunities. It highlights student work. We generally give this about 45 minutes to an hour. We literally set up a room with a whole bunch of tables and easels, and the schools just come in and just set stuff up. And then they and then they can um, they talk about um, they talk about uh, their ideas and what's happening in their school. And we found this to be a really great way for students to share ideas and get ideas from others. Tammy was giving you a lot of examples of like the junk to funk. That happened, those ideas got spread during this session. Um, the other thing we do is um, pop-up success stories. So this could be five to seven minutes in front of the whole audience. So we're in our main theater, they get you know five minutes and it's quick, fun, and informative talking. Um, uh, so a school team will present about their school. We've typically given this slot to um, the colleges, because the colleges have done so much, um, but it's really um, it's it's really been quite um, successful, and it's very inspiring. So a lot of this is really about how it's solution oriented, and so we want to push that as the end result. So we're look, we're looking towards that. So you can just get a little bit of a sense of the whole of the whole thing. I want to point out you can see that there's a, a video happening here. Um, one of the jobs of our summiteer team is to actually create a video of the summit each year, and so that's what's happening in this in this photo. So students are getting experience in media and uh, and development. There's some of those junk to funk dresses that the students made and wore. It's kind of those are super fun. So the climate action plan. Again, we have this right online, and um, you can download the whole thing. You can tweak it however you want to use it, and, I, and we can help you do that. We're happy to share those files. Um, so this climate action plan. This portion of the of the summit is on, happens for us on day two, and it's typically um, you know one to two hours in length, and the students work together in their school teams um, to come up with that plan and a goal, goals and a framework to implement back at their school over the course of the year. So you can just see the general setup. Again, this is available for downloading on the, on the website, but um, they, have to, they really have to ask these questions and think through it. It's important for this to be at the, um, at the, towards the end of the summit because they're really thinking about, they, they've learned all this content, all this information, and met all these amazing people and uh, connected with all these people, and they absolutely want to um, download and really brain dump all of their ideas onto this. So we provide during this session both these forms as well as tons of like markers and you know large sheets of paper, and they can draw it and do all sorts of things um, in order to get their ideas onto table onto the table, and then start focus, focusing on the action plan. At the very end of the summit, we have a report out session. So each school actually stands up and presents their climate action plan to the rest, to everyone else. So this, um, we try to allow three to five minutes for this, and always takes longer, um, because the students have so much to share. And it is, um, again, a place where they can get ideas from each other, but it also um, 
kind of seals the deal. It like makes everyone, we are all part of the solution action and uh, it's exciting to see, um, to see what this will come up with. Some of the other pieces that we try to bring into, into it are, um, I mentioned earlier, the have fun. So we set up a green photo booth so the schools can take teams and take pictures and send back to their friends. Um, this past year we had a mural, so each, um, each school had the opportunity to create a puzzle, to paint a puzzle piece and contribute that to a mural. Um, we've had um, just the idea, you know, as a museum we want to be interactive and, and, really part and really encourage people to participate, so we really try to make that, um, make that happen. So the leaves on, the, on your screen um, actually have little commitments that the students um, made like walk to school or um, recycle more, or take shorter showers, just small things, but it kind of makes it a, just a, a fun thing that's, you know, set up in the, in the corner. Um, these are usually, this is part of our, our the big map um, that we showed at the very beginning, um, so just adding those commitments. Publicity and social media. That's a huge part of the summit, and um, being able to communicate online and um, in every way possible um, through social media is critical. This is where um, actually the students are, are wonderful with this. We, we, from our youth steering committee, we have um, at least two or three students that are really interested in, you know, being in charge of our Facebook page, to, you know, tweeting, Instagram, like all of those social media outlets and platforms. Um, they really love to do that and can really um, reach out to the audience in the way that um, I, frankly, I couldn't um, make that happen in the same way that the students can. And so that's really important. We also train these student leaders to be a part of the, um, to be part of the media core. And so when we get, when reporters show up, we actually have the opportunity, the students are, placed, are do all the interviews. So that's the Facebook page, and there's that mural in the background that we just were uh, working on. Um, as part of the summit, one of our workshops is a video create, creating um, a video workshop on communicating climate change. These are all on the Youth Climate Summit um, website, uh, wildcenter.org slash youth climate. Um, so you can watch these. This is like what happened last year. So these are all of our summit videos that the schools made during the Youth Climate Summit. So it's really um, fun to see that, that interpretation and then the schools, the teams take them back to their schools to share in a variety of different ways. We need to, each and every one of you to do something, do one thing, start today. I think climate change is the biggest threat to our citizens in the world. Change is a really serious issue. It's going to affect people across the globe. It's affecting people right here in the U.S. right now. As far as I know, this water is not what we all need to survive the world potable. Do not drink it. You know, whether you're speaking about it, whether you're acting on it, to really change the direction that we're going on. As you guys know, our climate is being affected right now. People are losing their homes, losing their lives. It's only going to get worse unless we change our trajectory. This is a revolution that's happening. You guys can be part of it. So as the temperatures get hotter, that's something that we're really going to have to think about here. Local purchasing um, certainly reduces our carbon footprint when we work with local producers. Food travels a shorter distance and is typically less processed or unprocessed, also reducing um, our carbon footprint. The biggest way is to help reduce our carbon footprint and to um, help slow climate change is to learn about renewable energy. To learn how to work together and take everything that they've learned in school to be able to apply it in a way that makes sense to make a difference in the future.
job thing a couple of times. The steering committee really um, really is important in all of this. They serve as ambassadors. And so when the day when the day comes for your youth climate summit, all of a sudden you have like between 15 and 20 extra people to help you from greeting schools to um, to doing media interviews to helping run the compost station to taking boat team photos to introducing speakers. There's all sorts of different things that the summits actually, the summit um, summiteers do um, to help make the summit happen. And so this is really, um, really important. They have help with all the setups, so they actually show up two days, or a day before the summit, and we put everything together. Uh, yeah, so um, they did actually, as part of the, uh, we have a video workshop that's actually part of the um, the regular scheduled workshop. So we get teams of like two to three students that, um, and we have a teacher that's really good with uh, IT, and he makes it happen. And so he works with those students, and they have um, they, he brings in the computers from his school, and they work on those videos during the course of the summit, and they do everything there. In this picture on the right, that's actually. Um, a reporter interviewing one of the students. So that's not that's not the camera we hand out to the students. <laughs> that's actually um, that's a reporter that came in to do TV spots. Um, conference evaluation. So we evaluate the, the summit in multiple ways. Um, so we have both written and kind of oral debrief. We also um, we also uh, evaluate all the different workshops. Um, in, on the toolkit page, you can actually um, download this form as well as the workshop form, um, the workshop evaluation form. We also have a link to a evaluation, uh, evaluation that was done by Randy Korn and Associates um, year two of the summit, and which was through an Institute for Museum and Library Services grant. So um, you can see all of the evaluation stuff online. Um, so this has really been very important in making sure that um, this, we are listening to the students. Like we actually hand out the evaluations. We, we don't let them leave with them. They, we, have, we hand them out before the last plenary session, and they fill it all out then, and then we collect them. So we have a really high rate of return. Which and we also do, I do a debrief with our summit steering committee. Um, so that's usually over pizza as a celebration after the, after the summit. Um, like a week or so after, and then that way I can hear back from them. I hear from the. I also speak with the speakers that came. Uh, we see these evaluations and the workshop evaluations. So we collect all this data, and that really helps inform how we plan the next climate summit. Again, I'm happy to go into more detail um, after after this webinar and set up um, individual phone calls with anyone who's interested. Um, around 20 people. Could you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. So now I'd actually like to introduce Erin uh, Weaver, and she is going to um, share her experiences with the Youth Climate Summit. Hello, everybody, and happy Earth Day. Uh, my name is Erin Weaver, and I was born and raised in Lake Placid, New York. I'm currently a freshman at Georgetown University pursuing a degree in political economy with a minor in science, technology, and international affairs. I first attended the Adirondack Youth Climate Summit during my junior year of high school while taking AP Environmental Science with Mrs. Morgan. That summit inspired me to create an outdoor classroom at my high school and become more involved with the environmental club. I really took on a leadership role my senior year when I joined in the planning process and the summit steering committee for the 2013 summit. 
I worked on scheduling and speaking um, with Jen Kretzer, planning the plenary sessions, deciding how best to fill the slot with a d diverse and engaging workshop. We had to consider students' energy levels and needs throughout the day and balance the proportion of small group and lecture presentations. I also volunteered at the actual summit and served as a spokesperson, helping to introduce speakers and enhance publicity. My participation in the planning and execution of the summit were some of the most meaningful experiences of my high school career, especially as I was simultaneously involved with filming The Resilient Ones, a documentary about climate change in the Adirondacks. Uh, the film was a collaboration between Mountain Lake PBS and Bright Blue Eco Media to explore climate change in our region in the wake of Hurricane Irene. Originally, the intent was to document changes in the Adirondack Park and adaptations being implemented. However, once the producers met with the summit coordinators and students like myself planning and participating in the process, the focus shifted to our journey and regional solutions through our lens. I attended field trips and completed short interviews for the film, and the crew was present at our summit steering committee meeting and the actual summit. The Resilient Ones is an insider look into the preparation and execution of a youth climate summit. Through, through the lens of students, namely myself and two local peers, the documentary also sought to visualize climate realities and outline strategies uh, for change. I was honored to be a, a focal point for the film, and the cameras and interviews <laughs> added to my amazing summit experience. When you think about climate change as a younger person, what do you think about? It's easy to feel really helpless. A lot of the time, you're just a kid and all of these things are happening. Some people don't even care about it. This is what I need to do, and this is really important to me. It's become a major, major part of my life. We figure out what our jobs are and what we want to accomplish, and then we go to the Youth Summit and find ways to accomplish our goals. It's as simple as that. And it's almost do or die. If you look at the projected rates, if we stop all CO2 usage now, it's still going up. And that's something that's really scary. We can't be angry about that and then think that it doesn't matter. We have to take the action, be the bigger person, and we know that we didn't cause this, but we can fix it. You know, tracking the high school students as they planned and hosted the Youth Climate Summit really turned out to be a great strategy. We were able to meet experts along the way and learn how people in the Adirondack region are adapting to climate change. And this message is going to be relevant to everyone, not just New York. If we want to solve this big problem of climate change, we're going to have to embrace the innovative solutions we learned about. And we're going to have to find human solutions expressed in social sciences and the arts. This is about a cultural shift. Every generation has their big turning point. This is our turning point. This is the story that we're writing, how the humans saved the Earth. And we want to be known for that, not known that we destroyed it. So my involvement in both the summit and the resilient one uh, made me realize my deep passion for environmental advocacy and influenced my studies at Georgetown and my career aspirations. I'm very interested in environmental policy and crafting a more sustainable future for our federal government. The summit also allowed me to enhance valuable skills, such as the art of public relations, networking, and social media press. The knowledge and confidence I've gained have been invaluable, and I truly wish that every young adult could have the opportunity to attend a youth climate summit to gain empowerment and climate literacy. Students are often disconnected from current events and activist movements. They learn about problems like climate change and the dangers of inaction in the classroom, but they aren't usually given a toolkit to change or do good, and they can usually end up feeling helpless. Youth Climate Summit expose these students to resources in their communities, innovative uh, ideas from other schools, and professionals doing meaningful work that they can mirror. I truly believe that action requires empowerment, and Youth Climate Summits offer that short dose of urgency and excitement for students to bring back to their homes and schools. The hands-on climate action plans made at the summit are solution-oriented and often impactful in their communities. It was a very meaningful experience to me that I wish to share with many others. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Jen to talk about other resources available. So I, um, 
wanted to mention a few resources that are out there that to, to help you um, in your planning process. Um, we've been working with the Alliance for Climate Education now for um, almost four years, and uh, they are an amazing organization and um, have uh, offices in, uh, across the um, across the country. And if you're in an area that um, is uh, is located, I really encourage you to reach out and explore their um, climate assemblies. They offer, they have these amazing multimedia climate assemblies that um, that they can um, bring to your school or to your um, museum or institution. And they're and they're wonderful and they're very much geared towards um, high school and uh, high school students. They also have a lot of resources on their page and. Um, I encourage you to explore um, aspace.org to get more information. Next slide, please. Another group um, that I'd like to point, um, point you towards as a resource is UCAR, the University Cooperation for Atmospheric Research. They have a site, um, part of their work is called climatevoices.org. And as you can see just from this screenshot, um, it's basically an interactive map where you can find uh, um, scientists in your location and then you can contact them directly and it will give you a bio and show you exactly what um, they, it will show you exactly uh, what they can talk about and um, their expertise as well as you know all of the details so um, they have uh, you know there are scientists all across the United States uh, that are part of the speaker bureau we actually one of our scientists Dr. Kurt Steger, um is on this list. He's in northern New York. He's an amazing speaker. Um, so hopefully you can find and reach out to scientists um, in your area. Next slide, please. Um, the Green Schools Alliance is another group that has an incredible amount of resources online and um, that they're happy to, to share with schools. Um, and if you're a high school out there, I encourage you to explore um, explore working with them. They're, it's free to join, and there's lots of great benefits of, of being part of their network. Next slide. Of course, we've got um, NOAA and the climate.gov uh, website. Uh, I can't emphasize enough how much wonderful teaching resources are on here in that teaching climate tab. Um, there's just there's so much great information on the most current science, and it's really fantastic. So, so please go check out climate.gov. And the next, and of course, the same goes for the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, a great um, weapon, or great videos on energy literacy, all kinds of different activities. So these are these are um, things that you can incorporate and do right at you know right at your summit. Um, that can either be led if you're a museum museum by your museum staff or by other teachers. Um, so it can help you get started on that next generation of climate and energy literate people. Um, I'd also uh, like to mention um, the United Nations Climate Change Conference, and I'd like to invite um, Walter to maybe say a couple words about this. Well, thank you so much. And first of all, I, as much as I knew about this project from the Wild Center, having it explained here by you and the students blew me away, really. Yeah. Honestly, it is such a, a good example that shows how science and in a community can be a platform and bring together all the stakeholders to, at the end of the day, build something that's really significant. So I had to say this before I speak about my own my own plan. So congratulations for this business media meeting. So what we want to do in COP21? COP21 is going to be probably the most important climate conference uh, over the last years. We expect a lot from it. Uh, and as we have done before in Denmark, and as we have done at the Rio Summit in, uh, in 2012, we will have teams of young people from all over the world exchanging their own experiences about how their own uh, climate actions are going in, in their region. And we have used the Wild Center as an example to promote throughout the world as being one of these initiatives that they could take to select the teams that they will bring together and so at this moment, we have teams from the uh, Monzo Nubo, from La Plata University in Argentina. We have, and Europe has selected Eureka. Hey, surprise. Uh, Eureka, that has been working with you for three years on this one. Europe has found that now this is the best way to represent Europe. So you can be uh, very proud of that as well. 
so we will bring uh, all the continents together. Uh, they will exchange uh, uh, climate action plans, but they will do that not only for the people viewing it on the internet worldwide, but locally with experts that will be together at the top conference as well. And they will then convert their perspective as negotiators there, comment on what the youth is doing. And I, I have been sitting on that before. I know that this will be really enriching both for them who are in the negotiations, believe it or not, but also for the kids as well. So we really looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Walter. Um, I also would just like to show our uh, contact information, and you're absolutely welcome to contact any of us at any time and visit us online. Um, we are going to have a question and answer um, session now, and are happy to um, do that. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. Um, I'd like to. We actually have some special guests here, um, and so I'd like to invite. Um, it's someone from NOAA and also someone from the White House. So let uh, Frank, do you want to lead us off? Sure. So um, just some reflections right sure. off the top. So uh, something, you know, I'm Frank Nepold. I'm at NOAA in the Climate Program Office, but I'm also with the U.S. Global Change Research Program. And uh, a decade ago, I was brought in from the classroom at NASA to lead climate education. Uh, so a decade ago, we started. Climate literacy didn't exist as a concept. It exists now. I was very proud to hear it used boldly and strongly and, and uh, doing amazing things. That makes me incredibly happy. I feel very parental at the moment. It's <laughs> uh, a good thing. So, uh, but you know, uh, one of the, 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 the challenges we have that I think you guys have tapped into in a, in a way that is quite powerful is the realization that one in four people in the nation is a student. One in four, right? That's a huge market community um, to, to activate, to engage, to empower through knowledge and skills, and, and then see where that goes. And I mean, we have two people in the room who have already shown a path change. And I think that that's really one of the things that is, you know, that I would, I would encourage you as a group who are interested in this is how does and it's a really tricky question to answer, but how do these summits change career paths, life paths? Um, it's not just what happened at the summit, but what happened beyond that? Because I think when you tap learning and relevance together, you weave them together, as a former teacher, uh, you can do amazing things. One of the things we heard at, 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 uh, at a recent summit at the White House was that we really are focusing climate and energy literacy across the curriculum. A lot of times people think it's just the science classroom. I heard powerfully that it, you guys are looking beyond that. I think that that's you know, reinforced by a lot of other people who are beginning to realize this is not just a science um, uh, issue. Um, and so I think that that's a very important thing. And the other thing that I want to reinforce from what I heard, and I've known this from, from a lot of other program activities, is the, the youth engagement on this issue um, tends to move and pivot to the positive solution space very fast uh, in much more um, uh, substantial ways than adults. Adults tend to, to go to the depressed and, and um, reinforce the status quo uh, or, or defend the status quo. That's a very interesting phenomena when you get into intergenerational engagement. There's some really powerful work there. Um, but I think that you also are tapping into this idea of signaling opportunities for where these, because that's really where we're transitioning to, is what are we going to do to make the, the nation much more resilient to the changes that we can't stop and reduce the changes that we see through carbon reductions. Those are, are really huge opportunities that are before students but you know, it's not just the students. Obviously, what Walter was saying is we're setting things in motion that you guys are going to be part of for a very long time. So I think you know, um, I'm, I'm really encouraged and, and appreciate, as Walter did, the deepening of an understanding of what this was. We highlighted your work today on climate.gov. I'm very happy to do so. Um, and uh, but I think you know, exploring where where this goes beyond here. 
and uh, in a in a, a powerful way is, is something that I'm very encouraged to explore with you together. So I, I'm I you know stunned and amazed, <laughs> but not surprised. Uh, as a former teacher, I, I know this is it there, but you guys have done it in a very robust way, and I appreciate it uh, immensely. Thank you, Laura. Would you like to share? Hi, um, I'm Laura Patesh. I'm a assistant director for climate adaptation and ecosystems at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. I'd like to echo everyone's thanks to the team here for doing such a great job in communicating about youth climate summits and uh, what an opportunity they are. Um, in December, uh, we launched the White House Climate Education and Literacy Initiative with the goal of ensuring that all American students and citizens are climate literate. Um, we were happy to see the um, Wild Center and Aztecs interest in expanding the Youth Climate Summit program as one of the commitments under this initiative. Um, we were also happy to be able to honor one of the alums of the White House Campaign of Change, Gina. So um, this is a really great effort that we're very excited to see as a model that can be replicated elsewhere. If I were in your shoes, I might feel intimidated after the presentation today because it is mind-blowing um, how much work has gone into this and how much effort this takes. But I would also um, really you know, pay attention to the fact that there is a toolkit and that you have the team here to serve as a resource for you. Um, so that you don't need to reinvent the wheel if you're interested in pursuing something like this in your community. I also think, you know, you don't necessarily have to use the exact same model. Um, this can be scalable, so if it's not feasible to do 200 students or whatever, you know, just think about what makes sense for you um, and connect to, the, to Jen and others and, and check out the toolkit um, if you're interested in pursuing this. Um, this didn't happen overnight, so no. <laughs> a lot of work has gone into this. And um, anyway, uh, great presentation today. And I think the team here is happy to take any questions you may have. I, I would like to mention, just um, as we're waiting to see if anyone has questions, that um, just to echo what Laura said, like it took us a long time to get to where we're at. And youth summits are totally scalable. It could be one day. It could happen at one school. Or it could be, you know, um, 10 schools or 30 schools, um, it, it really um, is up to you um, and your project. And I, again, I'm really, like myself, I know Tammy, Meadow, or Erin, we, we'd all be happy to work with you um, and speak with you about how to make it scalable and share in more detail some of the other summits that have happened that can, um, that uh, have very different models. Um, and we invite you to take our toolkit and really um, use what, whatever you want or not. Um, it's really adaptable and up to you. We have a question from Mackenzie. Do you know about what percent of the student team to attend actually follow through with their action plan? Yeah, that's a great question. So we do actually, um, uh, and on the toolkit, we send out a progress report, which happens about um, six months out. And since our summit started in 2009, we've actually now expanded our program to a year-round program. And so that, what that looks like is that I actually do a lot of work out at the school um, during the course of the year. I'm, in, I, um, I'm connected with teachers and students online. Um, we, do, we work with the Alliance for Climate Education, and they actually come and do climate assemblies with us, um, which we raise money to do that. And uh, we help support events um, like uh, Tammy's uh, Big Green Shindig um, by sending, sending um, Staff and you know helping helping her um, as much as we can. So um, the, that percentage has actually grown. Um, so in the beginning it was harder. Schools were really like trying to get traction, but actually you know not. You know, I think reflective of kind of a national sort of a national movement on climate change that there is there is more success. So um, so we are actually seeing a much bigger increase in. Um, in those climate action plans, and I think I mentioned at one point that the summit, um, that those climate action plans, it's really important to help schools identify what uh, what out of their list of all the wonderful things they want to do is actually achievable, and go for the low hanging fruit. So things like you know getting smart meters, or turning out the lights, or um, you know starting for an awareness campaign, like are are more achievable sometimes than the solar panels on the roof, and so you want students to feel hopeful and encouraged. And so I help mentor the schools through that. 
Another question from Ryan. How do you manage focusing teams on projects they can implement and complete versus having them dreaming big on larger, more prolific projects? Okay, go ahead, Meadow. Please. Um, this is Meadow speaking. I think that you come out of the summit with a lot of big ideas. And as students, you sort of know what is attainable and what what isn't. So a lot of the schools have really worked their way up. I know when I started as a when I started in the very first year of the summit, uh, we had all of these huge plans. We were going to start our community garden, and you know we were going to change our recycling program, and we we're going to start using local food in our in our uh, schools and everything. And we slowly realized what was the steps that we needed to take and that we needed to build on it. So first, we started with my school was. Uh, the Red Storm. So we were the Red Storm Recycling Program, and that's the first thing that we really implemented across our school. And then uh, we started working with the elementary school, and they started a fifth grade eco club. So we got it sort of within every level of our school, from the high school down. And then we, as this has progressed, we've, we have now a farm to fork with where our cafeterias use local food. So each year, um, the students speak to the older students who have been through this process and really get to know them, and then they can build on that. Now my school has a pellet boiler installed that heats our entire uh, elementary and middle school. So students have made presentations to the board and went in and talked to them about that after they showed the, the process that they had been through and why it was important to them and why this is something that should be uh, important to our school district. So I think that you, you can start big, and you can see that in Lake Placid as well. You can still have those big ideas, but then you really work with your facilities. You, it's really important to have your school on board, have your school board listening to your students. And they love hearing from the students. So I think that once you get those, uh, that line of communication going, you can really uh, build from there. We have a question from South Africa about uh, places where they can possibly go to get funding. And I would like to quickly just comment, I ran a similar summit in Costa Rica. And what I did was I reached out to the local business partners in my community with a five-page uh, five PowerPoint expressing what we were trying to do and tried to get a first round of commitment in year one, small level commitment. And then that really grew once they saw how successful year one was. But I'm not sure if Wild Center staff has other suggestions. Um, you know, funding is always um, an issue, and I'm not, you know, how it works internationally is, is um, not something that I know a lot about, but I think Josh's suggestion in working with um, local businesses, um, you know, we um, have tra tried uh, crowdfunding, um, so that online, you know, going online and actually, you know, putting it out to the putting it out to the world, and that was actually pretty successful, and that might be something you can look into. I don't know if there are um, foundations or groups in your community that um, might have uh, funding or even individuals that um, you could be connected to that might help support um, getting a summit off the ground. Does anyone else have suggestions, Walter? I mean. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. So uh, my question first is, have you ever considered asking money at SASTA in South Africa? SASTA is the South African Association of Science and Technology, which is a government organization uh, that funds science communication programs. SASTA, S-A-A-S-T-A. -A -S uh, that may be one way, and I can introduce you to there if you need to. Secondly, you may try to, you're in Durban, I see, to contact the, Nat the Natural History Museum in Durban with a very strong sustainability plan in the city and they are very committed to that topic. And it would be a great thing for you to try to, to come up with a suggestion. And, and, and I can also introduce to the director there if you need that. So maybe just uh, send me an email or, or to, the, to the webinar, and I will, I will make these connections for you. Thank you. We had a question from Mackenzie. Uh, 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 oh, Frank, one more comment on funding. Well, and so I mean, there's another piece of this puzzle. Um, because we've gone international, is uh, it, as part of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, all signatory countries, the United States is one, South Africa is one, uh, must complete Article 6 activities, which are education, training, and public access. Uh, I'm the reporting lead for the US government on, on, on those Article 6 activities. Um, 
every four years we have to, uh, you know, submit a report to the United Nations uh, on that called the Climate Action Report. Uh, you can go to the UN and see what the South African con contribution is. You could probably figure out who the point of contact in the, in the government for that is. And you might be able to get a higher level of commitment where you're connecting the type of activity that we just learned about, which is exactly in line with Article 6 um, activities uh, with, with those who are expecting to implement those for the, each country. So you're connecting those who have to, whether they have funds, they may have partners who have funds. But I think connecting uh, people who have to do it with people who can do it and do it well is a good opportunity for all of us. It's Article 6 of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The report that says what you did every four years is the Climate Action Report. Every country has to do one every four years. I see, yeah. I see that there's a question from um, uh, Mackenzie about selecting student leaders. Um, so for us, we work in a pretty rural area where the Wild Center is located. So we actually we work with our closest high schools. So Saranac Lake, Lake Placid, and Tupper Lake um, are all, you know, for us, they're close. They're 20 to uh, 40 miles away. Um, so I, I know that seems like a huge distance when you're in in a city. But um, and so out of those school teams, the leaders just kind of emerge. They tend to be students that have been to the summit um, in the past, and they um, they wanted step up and so they really um, become those um, those uh, spokespeople. We also make sure you know they have to attend the meetings. So we have attendance requirements um, and I actually will let Tammy maybe speak to the student leader piece as well. Yeah I, well I'd like to address the issue or the question before about maintaining how, how do you maintain the excitement that they get after the two days of being involved in the summit and, and my answer to that is consistency having having a set this is our day and our time that we always meet to touch base and to continue working towards our climate action goals and if you have those three goals and, and make sure that when you're developing the goals that you 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 keep it to this is these are our main these are the three things that we hope to accomplish this year and using that smart goal model is, is really helpful in, in creating plans that are, are able to be accomplished in that one year time frame. So being consistent, constantly going back and checking that list and prioritizing and reprioritizing. And the list changes as the year moves on and things that you thought you were going to accomplish kind of you know, may have taken a back seat. But maintaining that consistent meeting time with them, I think it is critical to accomplishing things in the end. And I think for high schools in particular, if, if there's any senior project component to graduation or community service requirements, tapping into that and, and making sure that students that know they have those requirements are aware that you have lots of great ways for them to meet those, those requirements prior to graduation. That's been a, a really key for us is, is the fact that they have a senior project that they need to complete by the end of the year and it, it's a community-based um, sharing opportunity for them. But they they need to do it to graduate. That, that, that I think has allowed my students to, to go above and beyond what we would have been able to do otherwise. Um, as far as student leaders, they, they evolve out of, out of the students that continually talk. And, and the projects that continue to that make it to the next level are led by one person in particular, two or three that are that are the, the ones that lead the charge, and they are the ones that connect. We connect with the Wild Center and that kind of put them, push them into their direction. Um, I'm also going to add to the student leader. Um, the student leader piece is that we actually have seen so much interest in the youth leadership, youth climate leadership component of this that. Um, we added this year a one-day um, workshop for unused leadership that we um, did with the Alliance for Climate Education. So we had about seven different schools um, send uh, you know, anywhere from two to four students for a one-day workshop on youth leadership. And I actually think that that piece can really grow. I mean, one of the, again, the challenge for us is the rurality. Like, when we're really far away from each other, it can be difficult to connect. but um, 
and sometimes when we're meeting at schools, we don't have internet access. So there's those kind of technical challenges. But um, but there's a lot of students that want to be a leader in this movement. So um, I don't think they'll have trouble finding those student leaders out there. They're really excited. They'll be so excited that you ask. Great. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. Again, I really encourage you to reach out. Um, we are going to be posting this uh, PowerPoint and the recording, and uh, we're happy to reach out and talk to you individually. Um, but again, happy Earth Day, and um, thanks for being here. <laughs>